tales for dark nights. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes from Christian Thompson, entitled God's Attic. The boy heard the soft tinkle of a bell as he entered the shop. It was cool and dark inside, not at all what he had expected. Scattered around the small store were all sorts of items, Everything from teddy bears to cuckoo clocks could be seen, each item set carefully upon neat wooden shelves or displayed within a glass case against one wall. A faint, musty smell like old clothing tinged the air. Something about the shop was unsettling, even frightening. Perhaps it was the dark or the smell, but it seemed to Toby that this was a dark place. Maybe even a dangerous one. As far as he could see, he was alone in the store. Hello? He called out tentatively. Is there anybody in here? Only dark, musty silence greeted him. He began to turn toward the door, thankful for an excuse to leave, when a voice spoke behind him. Living so soon? It asked. Toby spun around to see a tall, thin man leaning lazily against one of the glass display cases. Toby stared at the man, sure he had not been there before. He let out a soft chuckle, then took a few strides toward Toby. Toby drew back unconsciously as the man drew near. Now, my dear boy, he said, sounding hurt, there's no need to be frightened, I don't bite. The store owner was quite a sight. He resembled a human toothpick. Dressed in a tux of purple velvet, a red bow tie tied around his collar. A tall silk top hat, the same color as his tuxedo, was perched atop his head. The wide brim of his hat combined with the gloom of the shop bathed his face in shadows, though Toby could just make out a large pointy nose above a pencil-thin mustache. The only feature that could be clearly seen were his eyes, which were a bright neon green. But no. Toby watched with amazement as his eyes switched colors, flicking from green to red to blue, then back to green. Uh, who? Uh, who are you? Toby asked. The mysterious man extended one long-fingered hand, encased within an orange silk glove. Allow me to introduce myself, he said. The voice reminded Toby the kind of sleazy used car salesman that always shows up in the movies. Walter O. Whimsy, he announced, purveyor of rare and desirable artifacts at affordable prices. Despite the man's cheesy exterior, Toby found that there was something eminently likable about the shop owner. He took the hand, shook it, releasing it quickly. Then there was something unpleasant about touching the man. His skin experienced 
a slight tingle when he touched the hand, like one of those prank sticks of gum that shock whoever pulls it. Pleased to meet you, uh, Mr. O'Wimsey, he said, rubbing his hand against his pant leg and using the polite voice he always used when his father had people from work over for dinner. I'm Toby, O'Wimsey said, and jaw dropped. Toby Daly, I believe. But uh, how did you know? The boy was flabbergasted. I have a knack for guessing names, he replied and winked at Toby. So, he said, his manner becoming more businesslike, what brings you to my humble shop? Well, the boy said, the truth was he didn't really know. He had simply been passing by the shop when he... He had felt the urge to enter the strange building. I just... A whimsy give a soft, not quite sinister laugh. <laughs> yes, he said quietly. My shop does have that effect on some people. What is this place, anyway? Toby asked, looking around at the assorted items found all around the dingy room. This, my dear boy, is God's attic. Gathered here are some of the greatest treasures of this world and others. The man turned, walking toward the glass display case. Come on, my boy. Let me show you. Toby followed the man to the case. A whimsy drew a small golden key from his breast pocket, formed into the shape of a delicate question mark, with a purple gem set into the end. Dimly, Toby could see O'Wimsey's broad smile within the shadows of his face. He slipped the key into the lock before dropping it back into his breast pocket. Look here, he said, pulling a small glass vial, carefully stoppered from within the case. Inside was a slim black strand that Toby first mistook for a crack in the glass. This, O'Wimsey said with grandeur, is said to be the hair of Samson. They say whoever possesses it will possess Herculean strength. Toby looked at the hair with wonder. It couldn't be true, of course, but something, a feeling deep in his soul, told him that it was. He was about to ask the price when a whimsy slipped it quickly back into the case. He then drew out a very old book, carefully bound in white leather. On the cover were golden runes that no one in this world could translate. This, O'Wimsey said, is one of my proudest pieces. Unlike many of my others, its authenticity is assured. This, my dear boy, came from the shelves of the great monk himself, from the library on the edge of forever. Toby was not really listening. Something else had caught his attention. He pointed to it with wonder. How much for that? he asked. A whimsy looked where he was pointing. Sitting on the second shelf of the display case was a small golden ring set carefully upon a square of purple cloth. Ah, yes. Whimsy said, placing the book back in the case. He withdrew the ring, holding it in his palm for Toby to see. This, Toby, is said to date back to the 11th Egyptian dynasty, a possession of King Mentohotep himself. I was told from a man who gave it to me. He also told me that it possesses fabulous power, and that it will change the life of its wearer in wonderful ways. As with Samson's hair, Toby knew it could not be true, but found himself believing it anyway. What ways? he asked, eyeing the ring and thinking of the change that clinked metallically in his pocket. Oh, that I cannot say, Whimsy admitted. I myself have never tried it on for fear that... In reality, it is but an ordinary ring, void of any power. An old man, afraid to have his hopes and dreams dashed, I suppose. Silly, really. Could I? 
Toby began, and his voice sounded distant and far away. All of his focus was upon the ring in a whimsy's palm. Could I try it on? Of course, the man said. His grin broadened, and his eyes began to sparkle with an otherworldly light. Toby took the ring from a whimsy's outstretched hand, careful not to touch the man's palm. The metal felt cool against his skin, and he felt a shudder of pleasure as he touched it. As he slipped it onto his finger, he was amazed at how perfectly it fit. Not too loose, not too tight. He felt a surge of power rush up through his finger, across his body, and then nothing. Well? A whimsy asked. His voice sounded eager. Toby shook his head in disappointment. Nothing. When a whimsy spoke, he sounded let down. Well, he said, these things do happen. He paused, then spoke again, and he sounded brighter. Well, I can't very well sell a magic ring that isn't magic, he laughed. If you want to keep it free of charge. Toby looked up at a whimsy with gratitude. Despite the letdown, he still wanted the ring, still liked the way it felt on his finger, the way the light caught the etched hieroglyphs upon the gold surface. Really? he asked. Of course, you strike me as a good kid. Go ahead and take it. Thanks, he said, looking again at the ring, admiring its beauty. He turned, walking towards the door. A whimsy gave a wave, which Toby returned. Bye, Mr. A whimsy. I won't forget this. As the boy left, the thing that called itself Walter A whimsy sunk back into the shadows at the back of his shop, smirking in satisfaction. No, he said, lighting up a thin white cigarette that he had seemingly pulled from thin air. No, I don't think you will. Toby was more than halfway home when he became aware of the strange and frightening power of the ring. He looked down at his hand to admire it once more when, to his shock, over half of his hand was simply gone. The ring was still visible on his finger, but the finger itself was nowhere to be seen. It appeared to be floating in thin air. He screamed, but he was alone on the back country road. He tried to pull the ring from his finger, but his finger went right through where his hand should have been. He grabbed the ring, but he was unable to move it. He screamed again in terror as the invisibility began to spread, creeping up the back of his hand, his wrist, up to his forearm. He could no longer feel the limb at all, and he realized with horror that he was not only turning invisible, his body was actually disappearing. He tugged and tugged at the ring, but it wouldn't budge. It simply hung, suspended in the place where his hand should have been. He began to panic. This couldn't be happening. This couldn't be real. The image of the shop owner flashed through his frightened and confused mind, and a whimsy suddenly seemed less like a friendly, eccentric old man and more like Satan himself. Toby shirked his backpack, tore off his shirt. His arm was completely gone, and his chest was beginning to dissolve as well. His legs, his other arm, going, going. Gone. Toby felt the strange sensation, the feeling of nothing, touch his neck, creeping up over his face. Frantically, he felt his mind slipping, falling apart. He began to forget things, where he was, where he was going, who he was, until finally nothing more remained of Toby Daly. The ring fell to the ground, landing in the dusty road, glinting innocently in the bright sunlight. Our final story for this evening is brought to us by author John Morrissey, entitled Timekeeper.
A single lantern was the only source of light in the shop. Two men stood in the center of the room, spilling out broadening shadows across the floor and against the counter and the empty walls. The shorter and heavier of the men, the bearer of the lantern, moved. Shadows swooped and the floor creaked under his weight. He pushed a box into place, stepped on it, and reached up to hang the lantern from a hook descending from the ceiling. This done, he took a few steps to the counter. He blew a swirl of dust from the glass top and rubbed the surface clear with his handkerchief. "'It's only dust, Mr. Bell,' he said. "'If you decide to take this place, we'll have it spotless before we move in.' The taller man said nothing. With the light behind and above him, only a slight distance over his head, his face was obscured and his expression could not be seen. The other man continued, "'You won't find a better location in this town, Mr. Bell. You have two nice rooms upstairs for your living quarters, and a large room in back for storage or a workshop. And there's the big display window on the street,' he said earnestly. "'I'll take it, Mr. Lockyer,' and the tall man said. "'A wise decision, Mr. Bell. There's no property in this town more suitable for a jeweler's shop.' "'Not a jeweler, Mr. Lockyer,' Bell corrected him. Lockyer shook his head vigorously and waved his hand as if to brush away his air. "'No, uh, of course not. You're a clockmaster. You mentioned that. Sorry, Mr. Bell. I make and repair timepieces. I do not deal in trinkets.' "'You're certainly needed here, Mr. Bell. Do you know if anyone wants a clock or a watch repaired, he has to take it all the way down to Boston?' It's a long trip, and more often than not, it's a waste of time. I never waste time, Mr. Lockyer. People are going to be mighty glad you came here, and you will be too. You'll do well here, Mr. Bell, the smaller man said. He paused, smiling at the dark outline of the other, and then he went on. As a matter of fact, I have a watch you might look at when you're all set up. It was my grandfather's originally. Kept Perfect time for nearly a century, that watch did. But last year, I dropped it on the stone floor down at the railroad station, and that was the end of it. I took it to the best jeweler in Boston, and those people held on to it for nearly six months, and then told me they couldn't do a thing. It was beyond repair. Bring it to me. Do you think you might be able to replace the works? I'll repair it, Mr. Lockyer, Bell said. Take it to your office tomorrow. I will, Mr. Bell. I'll have the lease all ready for your signature. My men will get to work here first thing tomorrow morning. You'll be able to move in by the end of the week. I'll do my own cleaning and move in tomorrow. Just give me the keys. Lockyer looked uncomfortable. Well, now, it's always been our policy not to turn the place over to a tenant unless it's spotless, he said, looking around at the dusty surfaces and cobwebbed corners. I appreciate your hurry, but I just wouldn't feel right giving you a place in this condition. It needs a good cleaning. I always do my own cleaning. Let me have the keys. I'll be open for business tomorrow afternoon, the tall man said. You'll never manage that, Mr. Bell, said the other. There's too much to be done. I know how to make the best use of time, Mr. Lockyer. Come by at six tomorrow and your watch will be ready. Lockyer entered the shop a few minutes before six the following evening. He was astonished at the changes that had been wrought in a single day. The windows, the glass countertop, and the display case were all spotless. The floors and woodwork gleamed freshly polished. The shelves were filled with an assortment of clocks. Some were quite ordinary, others were like none that Lockyer had ever seen before. Bell was not in the shop. Lockyer went to the display case and stood for a closer look at the clocks behind the glass front. The hour struck and he was immersed in a medley of sound. Tiny chimes tinkled like tap crystal. Deep tolling bells and reverberant mellow gongs vied with chirps and whistles and birdsong in a brief fantasia. Scores of tiny figures came forth to mark the hour each in its own way. 
Lockyer found himself drawn to the capering figures of a harlequin turning handsprings, one of each of the six peals of the little silver bell at the very top of the clock. The figure was smaller than his thumb, yet it moved with supple smoothness, free of the awkward lurching of the clock figures he had seen so many times before. At the sixth stroke of the harlequin, it turned its final handspring, bowed, and retreated inside a pair of gaily painted doors that shut firmly behind it. Lockyer leaned close, stooping, his hands on his knees, fascinated by the tiny figure's grace. He started at the sound of the clockmaker's voice and straightened quickly to find Bell standing behind the display case. "'I'm sorry if I startled you,' the tall man said. "'I was watching. I was fascinated by this,' said Lockyer, his eyes returning to the clock, now placidly ticking its way, to another hour and another performance. "'I've never seen a clock like this, like any of these.' You must come again when the hour is striking and see the others. Some are quite unusual. They must be very expensive. Some are priceless. Others are less expensive than you might think. Lockyer leaned down to look closely at the Harlequin clock. He touched his pudgy fingers to the glass of the case like a childlike gesture and drew them back quickly in embarrassment. Looking at Bell, he said, "'How much is that one?' "'That one is not for sale, Mr. Lockyer. I've been offered a great deal of money for it, but I'm not prepared to let my little harlequin go. It's a marvelous piece of work. Everything in the shop is marvelous, and you've set it up all so quickly,' Lockyer said with a frank, ingenious smile. It's incredible that you accomplish so much in less than a day. Would you like your watch, Mr. Lockyer? Oh, surely you haven't had enough time. Lockyer broke off his protest as Bell drew out his grandfather's watch, bright and new-looking, and held it up for Lockyer to hear. The watch was ticking very softly. Lockyer took it, looked at it in amazement, and held it to his ear again. It will keep time for your grandchildren, Mr. Lockyer, and for their grandchildren, too. Lockyer's expression grew somber, but only for an instant. He asked, How did you do it? The watchmaker in Boston told me it was ruined. He said no one could fix it. There are very few things that can't be fixed. Perhaps I've had more experience than others. Looking from the watch to Bell in silent wonder, Lockyer said after a time, It looks brand new. I must admit I didn't think you could fix it. It was a pleasure, Mr. Lockyer. The smaller man looked at his watch again, held it to his ear, and shook his head bemusedly. He tucked the watch into his vest pocket and reached for his wallet. How much will it be? Bell raised his hand in an arresting gesture. There is no charge. But you must have put a lot of time and work into this. I never charge my first customer. You're very generous. Lockyer looked at the shelves behind the display case. Perhaps you mentioned that some of your clocks are not too expensive, and perhaps I'm sure my wife would be pleased with a nice clock for the mantle. Then we shall find one to her liking, Bell said. He walked slowly down the length of shelves, paused, retraced his steps, and at last stopped to take down a clock mounted atop a silver cylinder embellished with enameled swans on a woodland lake. He placed it on the countertop. The clock was silent. Its hands were fixed at a minute before twelve. It's waiting for its proper owner, he explained. He touched something at the back, and the clock began to tick. When the hands met at twelve, the cylinder opened, and, to the accompaniment of a sweet melody, a little dark-haired ballerina stepped forth, bowed, and began to dance. Lockyer stared at the figure in astonishment and murmured the single word, Antoinette. At the last stroke, the tiny dancer withdrew, and the cylinder closed around her. Lockyer continued to stare for a moment, then he rubbed his eyes and looked up at Bell. It's uncanny, he said. 
his voice hushed and slightly hoarse. We had a daughter. She loved to dance. We hoped that she'd be a ballerina, but it wasn't to be. She died of pneumonia two years ago. I'm very sorry, Mr. Locker. I hope I have not caused you pain. Oh, no. Oh, no, Mr. Bell. That little dancer is the image of Antoinette as she was when he lost her. Then you have your daughter back. Every time the hour strikes, she will dance as she did once. My wife will be so happy, said Lockyer, his eyes fixed on the clock. He spoke like a man voicing his private thoughts. She's never got on over it, really. She seldom leaves the house anymore, but that clock? I know it must be very expensive, but I'll manage to pay for it somehow. Bell stated the price... Lockyer gaped at him and at last cried. But that's ridiculous. You could sell this clock for a hundred times that much. I choose to sell it to you for exactly that price. No more, no less. Will you have it? I will. Then it's yours, the clockmaster said. He made a quick adjustment to the back, turning the hands to the proper time, and then he took up the clock and handed it to Lockyer. It's properly set now. It will require no further adjustment. I hope it brings you pleasure, and for your wife. It's certain to do that. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Lockyer said as he backed from the counter and the clock cradles in his arms. The clockmaster's shop soon became a point of interest in the town. School children and idlers clustered around the window to observe the hourly spectacle. Customers came in increasing numbers, some to bring a watch or clock for repair or adjustment, and some to buy one of the timepieces that Bell sold at such modest prices. All who entered the shop stayed long, entranced by the marvels of workmanship that filled the display case and lined the shelves. Lockyer was a regular visitor, at least once each week, usually more than that. He showed up at Bell's shop, to report on the remarkable accuracy of his watch, to thank Bell for the ballerina clock, and then to examine the latest product of Bell's workmanship. He was awed by the speed with which the clockmaker could create his marvelous mechanisms. Every week brought something new. Late in the year, when Lockyer stopped in the shop on a rainy afternoon, Bell was placing a new clock in the display case. At the sight of Lockyer, the clockmaker smiled and set the clock on the glass top, extending his hand in welcome. "'Would you care to see it work?' he asked. "'Yes, Mr. Bell,' said Lockyer eagerly. He put his umbrella in the stand by the door and came to the display case. He saw a dark sphere about the size of a cannonball. It appeared to be of crystal, so deep blue that it was almost black. Atop the opaque crystal was a small white and gold clock, no bigger than a child's fist. The hands of the clock stood at one minute to twelve. Lockyer studied the crystal and could distinguish nothing within but darkness. The clock was exquisite, the crystal flawless, but this seemed a disappointingly simple timepiece to come from one who was capable of the intricate and subtle mechanisms that filled the shop. As if he had read Lockyer's thoughts, Bell said, It's not quite so simple as it appears. Lockyer glanced sharply up in embarrassment. Bell smiled and set the clockwork going. It appeared to Lockyer that by the time the hands had met, the darkness in the crystal had softened somewhat. At the first stroke of twelve, a light appeared at the center. With each successive stroke, A new light glowed somewhere in the crystal, and all grew steadily brighter. The other lights moved with the central one, brightest of them all, and smaller lights, hardly more than pinpoints against the rich blue that now suffused the sphere, circled some of the outer lights. Silent and serene, they moved in stately procession around the bright center. At the ninth revolution, the lights began to fade and the darkness deepened. When the twelfth revolution was completed, only the faint glow at the center of the crystal remained, and then suddenly it was gone, and all within was darkness once again. "'That's marvelous!' 
It's... it's the universe, Lockyer blurted. Only a representation of one small part, said Bell, lifting the sphere and placing it in the case. It's incredible, Mr. Bell, incredible. Those lights and the way they move. How did you do it? I have my secrets. I thought you'd enjoy seeing this one, Mr. Lockyer. It will not be here after today. Are you actually selling that? Who could afford such a... Lockyer silenced himself abruptly, more embarrassed than before. Bell's dealings were no business but his own. If he undervalued his own work, the fact did not seem to trouble him or to do him any harm. I charged a fair price, and the woman who ordered this very special clock for her husband can well afford it. Sutherland. It can only be Elizabeth Sutherland. Bell nodded but said nothing, and Lockyer went on. Well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it hurts me, Mr. Bell. It really hurts me to think of a beautiful piece of workmanship, like this clock, being in the hands of a man like Paul Sutherland doesn't deserve it. Mrs. Sutherland seems to think he does. Elizabeth has forgiven him a hundred times. Taking him back when he's done things, Lockyer stopped himself. He gestured angrily and stood with a reddened face, glaring at a dark sphere. Perhaps she loves him, Mr. Lockyer. If she does, she's a fool. I'm not a prying man, but I can't help hearing things. And if only a fraction of the things I hear about Paul Sutherland and that crowd of friends are true, Elizabeth should have left him long ago. Things may improve, Mr. Lockyer. People do change. Bitterly, Lockyer said, some people do. I know Sutherland, and I know that he'll never change. Not if he lives to be a hundred. We must hope. Lockyer nodded impatiently and went to the door. He took his umbrella, put his hand on the doorknob, and then turned to Bell. Look, Mr. Bell, I'm sorry. I had no right to say the things I said. I got angry for a moment. Elizabeth is an old friend. A lot of people in this town respect her. It's perfectly all right, Mr. Lockyer. It isn't all right. That's what troubles me. Sutherland is cruel to his wife and children. He treats his servants brutally, and to think of her giving him something so exquisite, he gestured helplessly. As I said, we must hope. Perhaps this anniversary present will mark a turning point for the Sutherlands. Mrs. Sutherland arrived late that afternoon. She was a beautiful woman, her fine features almost untouched by time, her thick hair a glowing auburn, but years of unhappiness had left their mark in other ways. Her manner was cool and formal, and there was a tautness in her voice that served as a barrier to all but essential conversation. The sight of the clock changed her. She folded back her veil and looked with unfeigned delight at the motion of the tiny worlds within the sphere. When the last light faded, she turned eagerly to the clockmaker her eyes aglow, her expression animated. Mr. Bell, this is a wonder. I've never seen anything to rival it. My husband will be overwhelmed, she said exuberantly. I'm happy to see you so pleased, Mrs. Sutherland. I'm delighted. It's quite beyond anything I expected, Mr. Bell. She placed her glove, hands on the crystal, and looked into its dark depths. And as she looked, her expression hardened, and weariness seemed to enfold her like a shadow. When she addressed him again, the barrier was in place. If by any chance the clock should be damaged, Mr. Bell, we will, of course, take the greatest care of such a delicate mechanism, but children and servants can be clumsy. If some mischance should occur, I will repair it, said Mr. Bell. This town, like all towns, had its share of idlers and wastrels. Some of them were frequent observers of the noontime display in Bell's shop window, but, being the sort of men to whom punctuality was not so much a virtue as an imposition, they did not become patrons. 
Nearly a full year passed from his arrival before one of them visited the shop, and he came only to amuse himself at the clockmaker's expense. His name was Monson, and he was given to this kind of amusement. He was a portly, florid-faced man with a handsome feature and a confident manner, well-dressed and well-spoken. He belonged to a prominent and prosperous family, though he himself showed no signs of industry or concern for good repute. He came to the shop one morning, spent a quarter hour examining the clocks on display, and then introduced himself to Bell. "'Hapel, say you uh, repair damaged clocks and watched,' he went on. "'I do. "'I've heard that you can repair any march, no matter how badly it's been damaged.' People have been satisfied by my work. Perhaps they exaggerate. Well, if you're as good as they say, I have a little job for you. It should be no trouble at all for a man of your abilities. Monson drew a dirty, rolled-up handkerchief from his pocket, laid it on the countertop, and unfolded it to reveal a jumble of wheels, springs, and tiny bits of metal, a cracked dial, and a bent and battered watch case. All were encrusted with dried mud, and the case was scored and scratched. When Bell remained silent, Monsoon said, "'Too much for you?' and favored him with a bland smile. "'Perhaps not, Mr. Monson,' said Bell. Monson's smile wavered in the face of this calm response, but he quickly recovered. It slipped from my fingers and rolled into the roadway. A horse trod it into the dirt, and the wagon wheels rolled right over it. I thought it was beyond fixing, but this watch has sentimental value to me, and so I kept the pieces. Then, when I heard everyone in town singing your praises, I told them I'd bring the watch to you and let you show how good you really are. His smile was a mocking challenge. Come back tomorrow at four, Bell said, taking up the handkerchief full of fragments. "'So soon, Mr. Bell? You work fast.' "'I do not waste time, Mr. Monson. Neither mine nor other people's,' Bell replied. Monson left, and when he joined his friends who waited for him outside, their laughter could be heard inside the shop. The next day all three came at the appointed hour. Three other men, all well-dressed and in very high spirits, were also present, having entered only a few minutes earlier.' They joined the others around Monson when he greeted the clockmaker, placed his palms on the top of the display case, and said boldly, "'My watch, if you please, Mr. Bell.' "'Your watch, Mr. Monson,' said the clockmaker. He placed a small box on the glass and opened it. Inside was a spotless white handkerchief, Monson's own, as the monogram attested which he unfolded to reveal a watch in excellent condition. The hands were at two minutes past four. No, no, Mr. Bell, you must have misunderstood me. I want my own watch, not a replacement, said Monson, shaking his head. This is your watch. Monson took up the watch and inspected it front and back. After a time, he said, it may be my watch case, either the original or a damn clever imitation. But even if it is my own, the rest of it... He put the watch down and shook his head emphatically. I didn't authorize you to replace the works. I told you to repair them, and you said you would. I replaced only the parts that were missing, Bell said. I repaired your watch, Mr. Monson. Nobody could have repaired that watch, said Monson flatly. I handed you a lot of junk. You did indeed. Nevertheless, I repaired the watch. Do you want it, Mr. Monson? Of course I do. It's my watch, isn't it? You said so yourself. But if you think you're going to charge me some outrageous price, you better think again. I'm on to that trick. Bell quoted the price of his repairs. The men with Monson grinned at one another. One of them laughed. Whether Monson or Bell or the situation in which they found themselves in was the source of their amusement was not clear, but Monson did not appear to share their feelings. He took the coins from his pocket and dropped them, 
with a clatter on the glass top. He took up the watch, turned, and stalked from the shop without another word. Later that week, two of the men who had been with Monson came to Bell's shop. They looked over the clocks on display carefully and critically, and finally informed Bell that they intended to buy a clock for their club room at the hotel. Nothing on the shelves or in the display case was precisely what they had in mind, one of them explained further, but there were three that might be acceptable, provided the price was low enough. They pointed out the three, and when Bell told them the prices, they gaped at him in astonishment. "'What do you mean, asking prices like those?' one demanded. "'There's nobody in this town can pay that kind of money for a clock.' I hear that if you like people, you sell them a clock for practically nothing. What's wrong with us that you ask so much? Do we look like fools? said the other angrily. My prices vary, said Bell. You saw how little I asked from your friend. Well, then treat us the same way, if you don't want trouble, said the second man. Bell did not reply at once. Then, as if he had not heard the threat or had chosen to ignore it, he said, "'You gentlemen have chosen three of the most expensive clocks in my shop. I have others that cost much less. If we wanted a cheap clock, we'd go to the general store. We're willing to pay good money for your good workmanship, but we won't be gouged. Perhaps I can show you something else. The clocks you selected are very delicate.' I may have others more suitable for a gentleman's club room, Bell said. They blustered a bit, but were mollified by what they took as his apology. He went to his storeroom and brought out several sturdy clocks set in brass and polished mahogany with deep, resounding bells to mark the hour. The price of these clocks were absurdly low. The men examined them and selected one. But even as Bell was packing it carefully in a box for them, one of the men looked longingly at the first clock they had chosen. That clock with the little acrobat is still my favorite. Will you reconsider the price, he asked. I set my prices very carefully, gentlemen. It is impossible for me to bargain. How does that acrobat work, asked the other. That's what fascinates me. I didn't see any wires. I didn't see any wires on any of them. Be damned if I can figure out how those little people operate. What's your secret, Bell? Bell smiled, but said nothing. Probably just as well for us to get a good, sturdy clock and not one of those others. They're interesting, but they wouldn't last long once things got boisterous down at the club, said one of the men. The other laughed and said, Even a good, solid clock like this one may not last long. What do you say, Bell, if someone bounces this off a wall? Will it keep on telling proper time? If anything happens to this clock, come to me, Bell said. Elizabeth Sutherland revisited the clockmaker's shop in the spring. Bell was at the door, awaiting her arrival, and she waved to him as her carriage pulled up. She entered the shop with the light step of a girl. Holding back her veil, she looked around the shelves and turning to Bell, beaming. Mr. Bell, I came at a perfect time. "'You have a score of new creations on your shelves,' she exclaimed. "'I trust the clock you purchased last year is performing satisfactorily. "'It hasn't lost a second, and it's such a pleasure to watch. "'It seems to be just a bit different every time it strikes. "'The children love it, and Mr. Sutherland is absolutely fascinated by it. "'He keeps saying that he intends to come here himself "'and tell you how much pleasure he's gotten from it. I look forward to his visit, Mrs. Sutherland. Well, I hope he gets to it soon. He seems very tired lately. These are busy times, said Bell, ushering Mrs. Sutherland to the counter and seating her. Oh, it isn't overwork. He just seems weary. It's almost as if he's gotten much older in the last few months, she said, looking up at the shelves. Bell did not reply. He followed her gaze and then reached up to take the clock that had attracted her eye. He set it on the top of the counter. She leaned closer, examined it, and then looked at him and smiled expectantly. It's a lovely scene, Mr. Bell. So peaceful. I 
can't imagine what I'll see when it strikes. The hand stood at two minutes to three. The clock face was set in a gold dome that canopied a woodland scene, a still pond surrounded by willows. A rowboat about the size of a child's little finger floated near the center of the pond. In it was a figure in a straw hat dangling a fishing pole in the water. All was serene. When the first chime struck, the fisherman pulled up a tiny fish, unhooked it, and cast his line again to land a fish at each stroke. The three fish flopped and trashed at the bottom of the boat. The fisherman took them up and dropped them back into the water. As the ripples spread and faded, he settled in his seat, tilted his hat against the declining sun, lowered his line, and returned to his fishing. Mrs. Sutherland clapped her hands together in an innocent gesture of sheer delight. "'That's wonderful, Mr. Bill,' she exclaimed. "'Thank you, Mrs. Sutherland,' he said, taking up the clock to replace it on the shelf. "'Is there any other you'd like to see?' "'I love them all, Mr. Bill, but I'm really here to look for something suitable for my mother's birthday. "'You have a special clock in mind?' I was hoping you might have another clock like the one I bought for my husband. Alas, no. Each clock is unique, said Bell. But let me think. I may have something more suitable. He swept the shelves with a slow, searching gaze, then studied the contents of the display case. He stood for a time, frowning, a finger pressed to his lips. Then, excusing himself, he withdrew to his workroom. Some minutes later, he emerged, bearing a delicate white vase that contained twelve red rosebuds. A clock, Mr. Bell? she asked. He nodded, pointing to a small dial near the base, its hands at one minute to twelve. He set the clock going and placed it before Mrs. Sutherland. As the clock struck, a rosebud opened at each stroke, and a growing fragrance filled the air. She exclaimed softly in wonder and delight. Oh, Mr. Bell, it's absolutely perfect, she said when the last rose was full-blown. My mother adores roses. I couldn't give her a nicer present. I completed this clock only yesterday, Mrs. Sutherland. Just in time for Mother's birthday. Exactly on time, it appears, Bell said. Late in the summer, Paul Sutherland died quietly at his home. He was in his early forties and showed no evidence of disease, but in his last days he was a shrunken, white-haired man, drained and feeble in body and mind. His widow mourned him sincerely, but there were many in town who counted her fortunate to be free of him. In the fall, on a dark, rainy day of empty streets, Monson and two of his friends brought their damaged clock to Bell's shop. Monson stood on top of the display case and stepped back, laughing. The others joined in as Monson pointed to the shattered face. One of the lads fancies himself a marksman, Bell. How long will it take you to fix this one? he asked. Bell took up the clock and examined it, turning it on his hands. His expression was grave. "'Well, how long? We want it tomorrow. "'You're a fast worker, aren't you?' said one of them, "'glancing at his companions and laughing. "'Too much for you, Bell?' asked Monson. "'If you can't fix it, we'll take another one to replace it. "'A fancy one, one of your special models this time,' "'he added, gesturing toward the shelves. "'Those clocks are not for sale,' Bell said. "'You're a hell of a businessman, Bell. "'You don't want to sell your best goods.' And what you do decide to sell, you sell at crazy prices. He makes enough on the ones he sells to the rich. Is that it, Bell? One of Monson's companions asked. Yes. What are you up to with Liz Sutherland? Monson asked. She spends a good bit of time here, some people say. Don't get any ideas about her, Bell. Do you hear me? Leave my shop, said Bell. Leave? We're customers, Bell. You're a shopkeeper, and you'll treat us with respect. We want to look over these precious clocks of yours, all these not-for-sale treasures you're hoarding. 
and you'll show us what we tell you to show us. Leave my shop, Bell said, once again his voice level and unchanged. Put down the ruined clock and took a step toward him. How about this one, said Monson, moving swiftly to the shelves and picking up a creation of gold and porcelain and brightly enameled metal on which a single uniformed guardsman stood smartly at attention. Don't do anything to upset me now, Bell. I might drop it. Bell's voice was calm and icy cold. Put down the clock and leave my shop. Monson looked at his two friends and grinned. He cried sharply. Oops, careful now! And Fane dropping the clock, laughing loudly. At his motion, the figure was jarred and fell to the floor. Monson quickly replaced the clock on the shelf. I didn't mean to do that. You should have just kept quiet, Bell. We didn't intend any harm. Of course you intended harm, and you've accomplished it. The atmosphere in the shop had changed in an instant. Bell seemed to loom over the three men, and they, though all of them were more powerfully built than he, and some years younger, now shrank from him. He bent very gently, took up the fallen figure, and raised it close to his eyes. "'You can fix it, Bell?' one of the men said. "'Yes, you can fix things like that easily,' said the other. "'It's not as if we hurt anyone.' "'Don't bother about the clock we brought in. "'It was a joke, just a joke,' said the first. "'Monson stepped forward and thrust out his jaw defiantly. "'His voice was forced and unnaturally loud. "'Just a minute. "'Bell can fix that clock of ours, "'and there's no reason why he shouldn't. "'If I did any damage, any real damage, "'I'm willing to pay for it, "'as long as it's a fair price. "'We have nothing to apologize for. "'We'll pay, and that's the end of it.' Bell raised his eyes from the broken figure in his hand. I will calculate the proper payment, he said. The disappearance of Austin Monson and two of his cronies was a matter of general discussion and much speculation around town in the following months. Explanations of all sorts, from the ridiculous to the lurid, circulated for a day or two, then gave way to newer, but as time passed, interest waned, and soon the three vanished men were spoken of only by their friends. In the year that followed this cause celeb, Bell's clientele grew to include nearly everyone in town. Even the poorest family, it seemed, could afford to own a clock from his shop, and all his clocks, whatever the price, however simple or elaborate, kept perfect time. No customer was ever dissatisfied. Bell was always available to a customer or a casual visitor, always willing to demonstrate some ingenious new timepiece. By this time, Lockyer and his wife had become regular weekly visitors, and every week Bell had a new clock to display, ever more ingenious, sometimes close to magical. When the hour struck, one might see birds take wing or porpoises leap from a miniature sea or bats fly from a ruined belfry. Woodsmen fell trees, skaters swooped and spun and cut intricate figures, a trainer put tiny lions and tigers to their paces, jugglers tossed Indian clubs smaller than a fingernail, a sailor danced a hornpipe, a dervish twirled in ecstasy, the stately couple waltzed serenely while a quintet of periwig musicians played, and never were the movements of these little figures awkward or mechanical, but always smooth and natural. No wires or levers or tracks could be seen, only graceful and disciplined motion time after time. Bell seemed to sell his clocks as quickly as he could make them. Even those that were not for sale left the shop to be replaced on the shelves by new ones. Only a few were permanent. The little harlequin, whose acrobatics had captivated Lockyer on his first visit to the shop, was still in place, the fire-breathing dragon, on his hoard of gold and precious gems and skeletons in armor, was still in a corner of the window, slouching forth every hour to the terror and delight of all the children, and a trim little pavilion of gold and porcelain and bright stripes of red and blue enameled metal 
before which a uniformed guardsman marched and countermarched every hour, while a piper and drummer marked the beat, stood where it had been for so long as Lockyer could recall, a year at the very least. During the holiday season, Bell's shop was a crowded, busy place, cheerful and lively. Those few townspeople who did not yet own one of his clocks were finally about to make a purchase, and others wished to buy one as a special gift for a relative or friend. How he managed to do it, no one knew, but Bell met the increased demand and even produced a magnificent new clock, a lighted cathedral with carolers before its steps and a choir of angels hovering over its spires. He placed it in the window three days before Christmas, and every passerby stopped to marvel. In the cold, dark days of the new year, the mood of the town changed. No one criticized Bell or his work or complained of his pieces, but now the shop was often empty, no customers visiting, for two or three days running. The lockyers still came regularly, sometimes bringing their infant daughter. They noticed no change in Bell's manner and heard no word of complaint from him, but they sensed a difference that they could not explain to one another. New rumors had begun in the club room where Monson's friends still gathered, Here they drank and brooded, and their idle minds dwelt on the still unexplained disappearance of their own companions. As rumors do, their stories fed on themselves, and interwove one with another, corroborating exaggeration with misstatement and validating both with falsehood. In time, they became firmly convinced of their own imaginings. Bell was the culprit, said the rumor-mongers. Why? Envy, of course. That was plain to anyone who knew the facts. Monson had shown him up and made him look foolish. The ridiculous clockmaker had thought himself a rival for the widow's affections. Fancy a woman like her wedded to a shopkeeper. And when he learned of her preference for Monson, jealousy added to envy had pushed him to desperation. Monson had put him in his place, and he had sought revenge. It was obvious. Just what he had done to his rival and how, and why he had included others in the deed was not clear. Bell was too crafty to leave evidence that would give him away. No one questioned his shrewdness, but it was the guilty party, and that was plain to any reasonable person, and he must be brought to justice. At first the townspeople laughed at these wild tales, considering their source and their probable motive. But they heard them again and again, and in time a tiny seed of something, not quite doubt but perhaps a vague and reluctant uncertainty, took root in their minds. What was said so often, so earnestly, could not be completely without foundation, they told themselves. Not that they believed a word of it, but Bell was a mysterious man, no one would deny that. Where had he come from, and why had he come to this town? How could a man price his wares so erratically and stay in business, even prosper? Who bought those expensive clocks, and what became of the ones that were not for sale but nevertheless vanished from the shelves? How could anyone produce mechanisms of such delicacy and precision so quickly and yet so perfectly and still turn out sturdy, serviceable clocks at bargain prices? And if it was indeed true that Monson and his friends had been talking about visiting Bell on the very day of their disappearance, then the clockmaker owed the town an explanation. No amount of good workmanship, not even genius, exempted a man from the common judgment, said the good citizens. The rumors grew more insistent, the issue more troublesome, the questions more pointed as spring drew near. One evening, when the shop was closed and the streets empty, Lockyer tapped at the clockmaker's back door. Bell was in his workroom, as he usually was in the evening hours, and he opened the door after a short delay. Mr. Bell, you must seek protection, Lockyer said without preamble when the door opened. I need no protection, Bell replied. You do, Lockyer insisted. You must know the stories that are going around town. I have heard foolish rumors, Bell conceded. You and I know they're foolish, but others in town are beginning to believe them. 
There's talk of coming to your shop and demanding an account of Monson's disappearance. Bell's voice was unperturbed. My shop will be open at the usual hour. I have always been willing to answer reasonable questions. Will you come in, Mr. Lockyer? No, no, I can't, said Lockyer, drawing back. But you must do something to protect yourself. Monson's friends are behind this, and they want to hurt you. They may break in on you in the night. Will the townspeople permit this? Lockyer hesitated, and then lamely replied, No one wants anything to happen to you. But Monson's friends have everyone confused. They have a lot of influence in this town. Some of them do, anyway. And the people have heard so many stories that they don't know what to believe. They're confused. So I must fear the actions of a lawless mob. I'm afraid that's the case. You must protect yourself. I will, Mr. Lockyer, said Bell. Without another word, he closed the door. Lockyer heard the bolt slide into place. They came to the shop later that night, eleven men strong. Others waited outside, at front and back. Several had been customers at one time or another, and some had come on occasion to observe the clocks as they struck the hour, or watch the display in the window. Three, who had been present when Bell had presented Monson with his repaired watch, were the leaders. The others did not speak. "'We're here to find out what you did to our friends, Bell.' "'We're not leaving until we're satisfied,' said one, planting himself in front of the clockmaker. "'And why do you blame me?' Bell asked, looking calmly down on him. "'They said they were coming here. We all heard them say that. "'And then we never saw them again. "'You're the one behind their disappearance, all right. "'Just admit it, Bell. "'We can make you tell us everything if you force us to,' one of the others said. "'He raised a walking stick and tapped it on the glass top.' of the display case. "'We can smash this place to bits, and you with it,' said the first. "'Now tell us what you did to our friends.' Bell looked down at him, then at the man with the walking stick, then at such others as met his glance. He raised his hand and pointed to the door. "'It is best that you leave my shop,' he said. "'Best for you, that's certain, but we're not leaving,' said the first man, and several of the others." under the challenge of his ferocious gaze, murmured their agreement. Don't try to bluff us, Bell. You've bluffed this whole town for too long. Answer our questions, or it's going to get mighty unpleasant, said the second. He brought his stick down sharply. The glass cracked. Then suddenly, at exactly nine minutes past the hour of one, all the clocks in the shop began to strike in unison. Deep gongs and crystalline chimes... Resonant bells and the sound of tiny drums and trumpets, music and birdsong, and the din of an indistinguishable pealings and tolling and clanging, all blended to engulf the intruders in a wave of sound. And on and on they struck, twelve times and twelve more, and twelve times twelve more, rapidly at first, and then steadily diminishing in volume and rapidity, fading as if they were receding at a steady rate becoming even fainter until they could be heard no more. The men stood benumbed by the assault of sound. They felt no pain and sensed no restraint by external force. Not one of them carried any trace of physical harm as a result of that night. Their breath came freely. They could move their eyes and hear every sound. But their bodies were held as if the air had grown viscid and glutinous, clinging to them dragging at them like thick mud or heavy snow, but a thousand times more inhibitive than snow or mud, because invisible and insensible as it was, it clung not only to their feet and legs, but to their hands, arms, heads, and bodies. They felt as if time itself had crawled almost to a halt, congealing and trapping them within it like insects in amber. Those who spoke of that night and a few of them ever did so, and those few reluctantly, after long silence and still fearful of ridicule, agreed on several points. Bell, they all said, was untouched by the phenomenon. He removed the clocks from the shelves and the window and the display case, one by one, carefully and lovingly, and took them into his workshop. 
This process took some time, several hours at least, but none of them felt the pain or cramping that such a long period of enforced immobility or near immobility would be certain to cause. Val worked methodically, and, ignoring the intruders, his attention confined to his clocks. Of these facts all agreed, but each had his own peculiar memory of that night. According to one man, the shop grew steadily darker. Another said that the light remained constant, but Bell himself moved ever more swiftly, until at last he moved too fast for the eye to follow, and vanished from sight. A third man claimed that Bell grew more insubstantial and wraith-like with each timepiece he removed, and at last simply faded into nothingness. One man recalled a sight of a fly that passed before his face so slowly that he could count the beat of its wings. The fly progressed no more than a foot, and yet the man swore that its passage consumed three hours, at the very least. One of his companions spoke of the disturbing sight of ash fallen from the cigar in the hand of the man standing near him. It fell to the ground so slowly that in all the time he stood confined, no less than four hours by his calculation, it had not reached the floor. Two other men mentioned their awareness of each tick of a clock separated by an agonizing interval. One claimed a full hour's space while the other spoke only of a horrible long wait between one tick and the next. Whatever happened on that night, however it happened, and when the men could move, and their immobility ended in an instant without warning, Bell and all the clocks were gone. Five men fled the shop in terror the instant they had command of their legs. Those who remained did so more from fear of showing fear than from courage or even anger. They looked to one another uncertainly, awaiting direction, and finally someone said, we have to go after him. The workroom was dark and empty. They drew the bolt on the back door and one shouted to the others waiting outside, Did you see him? A man carrying a pick handle emerged from the shadows. Didn't see nobody. Nobody come out that back door. Are you sure? Of course we're sure, damn it, called an unseen voice near at hand. What happened? They'll get away from you? They did not reply. They returned to the shop and noticed something that had escaped them in the first shock of freedom. The shop was thick in dust, and cobwebs hung from the ceiling and rounded the upper corners of the shelves. The air was stale like that of a room long sealed. As they looked around them, the clock in the town hall struck quarter hour. One man looked at his watch and announced in a hushed voice, One fifteen. No one ever learned what became of the clockmaker. No clocks like his were ever seen again by any of the townspeople, even those who traveled wildly and took an interest in such things. Those that he sold have been passed on through three or four or even five generations. They keep perfect time and have never required repair. Thanks for joining me this week for tonight's regularly scheduled Tales of Terror. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Tonight's program has been brought to you by Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly, your host, Otis Jiry. Got a scary tale of your own you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com for your chance to have me bring your sinister story to life. If you enjoyed what you heard and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment for your chance to be entered into a weekly prize drawing. Your feedback means a lot to us. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. 
And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories or the Otis Jiry channel, my own digital home away from home, where you'll find dozens of previously released horror and sci-fi stories from yours truly. If you'd like to connect with or support me and CTFDN, visit the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Facebook page or at their website, chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can support our programs by becoming a patron and get access to hundreds of stories, all ad-free. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with another pair of terrifying tales that'll keep you up all night. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>